Gospel of Mark, chapter 12. Glory to you, O Lord. Then they sent to him some Pharisees and some Herodians to trap him in what he said. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Should we pay them, or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why are you putting me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me see it. And they brought one. And he said to them, Whose head is this, and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Jesus said to them, Give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed at him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Well, brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's hard to believe, but this Friday is already the 4th of July. It seems that June has just flown by. I can't hardly believe we're in the middle of summer already. This weekend, of course, we celebrate the birth of our nation. We celebrate the day that our nation declared independence from Great Britain. We celebrate that our nation dedicated itself to the pursuit of freedom. And of all the freedoms that our nation has pursued, perhaps the most important is the freedom of religion. The freedom to believe what we believe without fear to government. The separation of church and state. Now, separation of church and state is a wonderful idea, it's a wonderful thing, and I think both church and state, both church and the government, benefit when there is a wall of separation put between them, as Thomas Jefferson said. But there's also a way in which you can understand the separation of church and state that is not beneficial, I think. There's a way in which separation of church and state can be taken that actually does harm to both church and state, church and Sometimes it's taken or, or treated as though it means that Christians, the church, should have nothing to do with government, should have nothing to do with politics. These things should be kept absolutely separate from each other. Sometimes it's taken to, to mean that Christians should leave their Christianity behind when they engage in matters of politics or government. This, of course, keeps Christians from being able to do much in the world, and it keeps the world from benefiting much. Christians. Another way it is taken, and a way that I understood it growing up when I was younger, is that the church and the state, actually the church and the whole world, are always at odds against each other. They're always in conflict. When I was younger, I understood Christianity to, to mean that I couldn't participate in things of government and being a citizen of the United States because I was a citizen of heaven first, as Paul says in Philippians 3. So in high school, for a large uh, portion of my high school, I wouldn't say the Pledge of Allegiance, for example. I would stand when we said it, I would face the play, but I wouldn't say the words, because I didn't know how I could be a citizen of heaven on the one hand, and a citizen of an earthly nation like the United States. I didn't know how I could pledge allegiance to another nation while being a citizen of heaven. I didn't know how those things related. I thought the church had to stay away from the world, had to stay away from government, unless it become less holy, which, of course, I didn't want. But I think a very clear witness in our three readings today is that church and government must support each other, even if they are kept separate from each other. The state, of course, must not interfere in the matters of the church, and the church must not dictate legally to everyone else, but these two institutions, the church and the world, support each other even if they are kept separate from each other. Our reading from Jeremiah struck me as I was preparing for this sermon. And it struck me because in some ways the situation that Jeremiah is speaking to is similar to our situation, I think. You see, Jeremiah was a prophet, and he was a prophet at a time when the people of Israel had been taken away into exile by the Babylonian Empire. Jerusalem had been destroyed, the temple lay in ruins, and most of the people who lived in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas had been exiled to Babylon to live in cities among the people who did not speak their language, did not share their God, and did not share their culture and their stories. 
They had been taken away to live in another place, and their citizenship was in a place other than they lived. They were still the people of Israel. They still worshipped the God of Israel. Their citizenship was in Israel, and yet they found themselves in Babylon living there. Jeremiah is writing a letter to them. That's what our reading is today. Jeremiah is in Israel or Egypt, perhaps, and he's writing a letter to those in Babylon to the east. And you can imagine that some of those who have been exiled might have carried some harsh feelings towards the Babylonians whom they lived among. After all, they had destroyed their city, destroyed their temple. You can imagine them wanting to punish the Babylonians to make life difficult for them. And yet Jeremiah writes this to them. He says, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. He tells them to marry and have children. To give their children in marriage so that they have children as well. He says, seek the welfare, seek the peace, the shalom of the city in which you live. For in its peace you will find your peace, Jeremiah says. This is what God says to the Israelites in exile. Work for the peace, the good of the city in which you are in exile. You see, we also have a citizenship that is elsewhere. We have a citizenship that is different than the citizenship we have here. We are citizens of heaven as well as citizens of the United States of America. And sometimes those things are an intention and it's hard to know how to act. But God's words to the Israelites more than 2,500 years ago, I think, are the same words as they are to us. Seek the welfare, seek the peace of the city, of the place where I have set you, says God. Seek the welfare of the place where I have placed you to work my purposes, says God. God calls us to work for the good, to be citizens of where we are, even though our citizenship is in heaven as Paul tells us. Even though Paul, just a chapter earlier, said, do not be conformed to this world, in this chapter of our reading today, he said, be subject to the governing authorities, for God has instituted those authorities. They are instruments of God to encourage good behavior and to restrain evil behavior. The government exists for our benefit. That's why God instituted government in the first place. I don't know if perhaps you didn't know that that was your calling. Perhaps you didn't know that you were placed here in Dawson, Minnesota, in the United States of America, to serve a calling from God, a, vo a vocation from God. God is calling you to be good citizens here in this world. You have been placed here in order to work for the good of this town, this state, this nation, this world, even. God has called you right here to Dawson, Minnesota, to serve one another in acts of service, to work to improve the conditions of our life together. And maybe you didn't know that God called you here for that purpose, but you seem to be already fulfilling that call, for you already are serving one another. You serve one another by teaching one another. You are serving by pleading for one another. You are serving by providing health care, providing legal counsel, providing financial advice for one another. You are serving by faithfully growing and selling crops. You are serving by helping people make sense of insurance. You're serving people by providing jobs in this community, by providing quality food for this community. You are serving in the military. You are serving in public service, you are serving by voting. You are serving in construction of various kinds. You are serving by providing entertainment for one another, by laughing with one another, by crying with one another. You are serving by providing stable homes for your children. You're even serving, we read today in two of our readings, by paying your taxes. Even paying your taxes is fulfilling God's call, God's vocation on your lives. The ways you are fulfilling your callings are far too many to name. I've only scratched the surface. And I don't know, like I said, whether you have viewed these things as callings, as vocations from God, but you seem to have busied yourself about them nonetheless. Some of those examples may have seemed surprising. 
surprising because they're just so ordinary. They seem too ordinary to be something God would call you to, and yet they are. Or some of these things may seem surprising because they seem just a bit suspect. For me, paying taxes is one of those things. Maybe that's why we're told about it twice in our readings today. You see, my tax dollars go for a lot of good things, but they go for a lot of things that I'm not so thrilled about either. Some of the things my tax dollars go to seem to be a waste of money. Maybe it's a good intention, but it could be gone about in a different way, so I think anyway. And some of the things my tax dollars go to, I, I just don't think are good things at all. And yet my tax dollars do go for very good things, for schools, for roads, for public transportation, public services. They go to help those in need. There are very many worthy causes my tax dollars go to as well. God is calling me to support those in authority as they work for the good, however imperfectly, here on earth. That raises a question, for me anyways, just as I think Jeremiah's letter may have raised for his, the Israelites he was writing to. The question is, how can God call us to support something that is corrupt? How can God call us to support something when it's not 100% or sometimes even mostly good? How can God call us to support something that is so riddled with uh, inefficiencies and frustrations? For the Israelites, how can God call them to support the very people who had destroyed Jerusalem, had burned God's holy temple, and had taken the treasures back for their own treasury? How could God call us to support those sorts of things? Somebody told me once that all politics is corruption. And it's all corruption because it always involves compromise. In order for anything to get done in politics, the people involved have to compromise their ideals, what they think is right. They have to corrupt their ideals in order to make anything actually happen in politics. And I think that's exactly right, but it doesn't go far enough. For we live in a world that is totally twisted and taken over by sin. We live in a world where sin has turned everything at least partially away from what it was originally intended for. There is no escaping corruption. There is no escaping the compromise of ideals. Even the very best things that we do often have unintended negative consequences. All we can do is try and maximize the good and minimize the bad, but it's always a mix. There is always an element of corruption in it. But this corruption is no reason for Christians to withdraw from the world. In fact, it makes Christian involvement in the things of the world far more important than they otherwise would be. You see, if a person only has their earthly citizenship, if they do not know about any citizenship in heaven, they only know of what's here on earth, then their actions here on earth, the things that they do with their citizenship here, determine their future. If a person only has an earthly citizenship, they are limited in the amount of good that they can do, for they must act out of self-preservation. That's just the way the world works, this world that has been twisted by sin. But if a person has a different citizenship, if a person has a heavenly citizenship as well, well then they have been set free to act entirely selflessly because their future has been secured by another. Their actions have no bearing on their eternal future because God has decided that already and has promised to them it will be a good one. You see, you have been made citizens of heaven as well as citizens of earth. You have an eternal citizenship that has been secured by God, as well as your earthly citizenship as citizens of the United States of America. God has set you free from this world of sin in order to send you right back into it, that you may be a force for good in a world subjected to evil. Along the way, of course, you will mess up. You will make decisions that you later come to regret, and even your best actions will never be perfect. But don't let that stop you from acting, because you have something that's more powerful than any evil and all corruption. You have the promise of the forgiveness of sins. You have God's everlasting love. 
So as we celebrate this weekend our nation's independence, as we give thanks for our status as citizens of the United States of America, open your eyes and see the worldly work that God has set in front of you, the work that God is calling to you, ordinary, common work, work for your neighbor's good. Love this world as God loves it. Show your love by service to the world. Make use of your citizenship here in the time that you have, for you have been set free from sin, and your future has been secured. Amen.